So vestibular migraine, really the symptoms were first described um, in the Huangdi Neijing, it's the Chinese medicine, some of the earliest writings there, and then by Eretaeus of Cappadocia, um, well-known Greek physician. So they described these disorders of episodic vertigo with ringing in the ears um, and headache, visual changes. The, there are a lot of different terms that we use or that have been used like migraine associated vertigo. The term vestibular migraine um, was first introduced um, in the early 1900s and that's what we use now. That's you know the official term. So it is a very, very common cause if not the most common cause of episodic vertigo. Um, so BPPV is, is the other one. Um, you know, I would say in practice, I tend to see vestibular migraine just as much, if not more, than BPPV, and then a lot of the other inner ear disorder causes of dizziness. So it affects up to 2.7% of the population. Um, like I said, the most common cause of episodic or spontaneous vertigo, um, up there with BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, it is, even though it is the most common or one of the most common causes, it is um, under-recognized, so under-diagnosed and under-treated, unfortunately. Okay, so um, let's go over a little bit of the anatomy and the physiology of the inner ear. Um, so we have the three semicircular canals and then we have the utricle and the saccule. So that makes up the vestibular part of the inner ear. The cochlea here is um, for the hearing. So the three semicircular canals detect rotation in all the different planes. And then the utricle and the saccule, think of them as like gravity sensors. So they detect you know, where your head is in relation to gravity, as well as any kind of linear movement. And um, so um, the, the inner ear will send signals to the brain via the eighth cranial nerve, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Um, so the, the end cells are the, um, the hair cells and they have these little hair-like projections called cilia. The cilia move with um, the fluid movement of the inner ear with any kind of head movement. And the movement um, causes excitation or inhibition depending on the direction. And that's what will send those signals via the auditory or the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, and then we'll go on to the central pathways here. So from the eighth cranial nerve, um, it goes to the vestibular nuclei within the pons, or the pons and medulla junct junction um, in the brainstem. And that is also where we receive um, visual and proprioceptive input. Okay, so the brain uses all of these, so visual input, and then proprioceptive and tactile input. Um, so if you think of the, the stretch of the muscles um, and pressure on the footbed, things like that, um, that tells us where we are in space. Okay, and then from there we have projections into the cerebellum, um, mainly, but also the cerebral cortex. And then the efferent pathways, um, so strong connection between the inner ear and the eye muscles. So especially with the semicircular canals, um, that's what enables us to keep um, focus when our head is moving. So gaze stabilization or the vestibulo ocular reflex. And then postural, and that is um, closely connected to the utricle and the saccule. So, um, so our gravity sensors and keeping our body upright. So what do we think is going on with vestibular migraine? Um, probably similar to that of um, migraine headaches and a lot of the other migraine symptoms. So sensitization and activation of the trigeminal vascular system. So the trigeminal nerve, uh, the fifth cranial nerve, the largest one, it innervates um, the face, um, mainly sensory input. Um, and so when this is activated, there's a release of these inflammatory peptides. Uh, these are just a couple of them, substance P um, for pain, CGRP, serotonin, um, one of the neurotransmitters involved. And these are all involved in pain, so nociception, and then also um, they activate the vestibular cortices. 
the trigeminal nerve also innervates the inner ear, which is interesting. And um, so that's why, you know, we might get some of those peripheral symptoms in migraine. Um, so you can actually have hearing loss and loss of balance function in the inner ear with, um, with migraines on occasion. And then also these receptors, so the CGRP receptors and, um, and others are found in the inner ear and might have to do with fluid balance. So um, we know there's this, there's this connection between Meniere's disease and migraine, and this might be one of the reasons why, but again, not fully understood. So key points here, the, the central vestibular pathways are really complex. Um, they go to, you know, many different parts of the brain. So different areas can be affected and that's why patients will get um, all different kinds of symptoms. So it can be a spinning sensation, just more of a vague sense of disequilibrium. Um, and then because you can have multiple different areas of the brain affected at the same time, you can get a lot of, a lot of different symptoms in addition to the dizziness. So it makes it really um, challenging to diagnose. So simplified, this is how I explain it to my patients. You have this, um, this brain hypersensitivity. So that trigeminal vascular system um, is activated a little too easily, usually genetic. And then you get this perfect storm of triggers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then it causes, um, like I said, that activation and re release of those inflammatory peptides. All right, so um, here are the criteria. This is the Baronet Society, the International um, Vestibular Society, and the um, in International Classification of Headache Disorders. So to have vestibular migraine, you need to have at least five episodes of these vestibular symptoms, moderate to severe intensity, lasting five minutes to 72 hours. Um, usually there is some current or previous history of migraine headaches can be with or without aura. And then also one or more of the typical migraine features with at least half of the episodes. So headache with at least two of the following, um, the one-sided location pulsating, moderate to severe pain, and then aggravation by routine physical activity, light and sound sensitivity, and then visual aura. So you need to have at least one of those with at least half the episodes and then not accounted for by another vestibular diagnosis. And then probable vestibular migraine, um, which I would say is far more common. Only one of the criteria of BNC. So they might not have a history of migraine or they do have migraine, but they don't necessarily have those other migraine features with the episodes. Okay, so this can be really difficult to diagnose. Like I said, there can be many, many different symptoms. There are many different causes of dizziness. Um, and then there's a lack of objective findings. So usually the exam is normal, testing is normal, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then you can also have other disorders. So it kind of clouds the picture like Meniere's disease. Um, there's a much higher incidence of migraine in patients with Meniere's disease. And a lot of patients with Meniere's disease will have vestibular migraine as well. And then um, lack of evidence-based treatments, which we're gonna get to uh, in a little bit here. Um, a lot of what we do um, is extrapolated from migraine headache studies. So um, a lot of people make the mistake of confusing vestibular migraine with aura, um, but aura by definition only lasts five to 60 minutes and is always followed by the migraine headache. Um, but uh, it's different than the brain, brainstem migraine. You have to have two additional posterior circulatory symptoms. And typically with vestibular migraine, they're lasting, um, I would say seconds to days at a time. And then there was a study looking at uh, vestibular migraine is the criteria too restrictive. And I would agree that yes, in practice, um, it's, it's not very common to see patients who, who fit that, um, that definite uh, diagnostic criteria. So it's usually probable. 
like I said, symptoms will often last seconds at a time, so not necessarily five minutes. And then you can also see a chronic daily dizziness in addition to the little episodes so that it, it kind of clouds it a little bit when you put that 72 hour limit. And then a lot of times patients are unclear about their own history of migraine. Um, it's interesting, I'll ask a patient, do you have a history of migraine? And they'll say no. And then I ask, have you ever had a migraine? And they'll say, yes, well, it was years ago and I used to get them all the time. So yes, they have that, you know, the genetic predisposition to have this and all that, but um, they don't, you know, they don't, because they're not experiencing migraine headaches, they don't think it's related at all. So really important to get a good history um, about whether or not they've ever had a migraine headache. So there is a lot of symptom overlap, like I said, Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is, um, you can think of it like an inner ear swelling or distension of that endolymph um, within the inner ear, and it causes episodes of prolonged vertigo, hearing loss and ringing in the ear tinnitus, and then pressure in the ear. And over time, it will cause actually permanent damage to the hearing, to the balance of that, that affected ear. Um, and so there's a lot of talk now is my is Meniere's disease um, a form of migraine? So like I said before, the trigeminal nerve innervates the inner ear. A lot of those um, neuroreceptors are in the inner ear and kind of deal with the fluid balance. A lot of the triggers are the same. And then again, a lot of patients with Meniere's disease also have a history of migraine. A lot of the triggers are the same. And a lot of times you can get these purely Meniere's episodes of fit criteria along with the migraine symptoms like light and sound sensitivity and, and sometimes a headache as well. And then 3PD, this is persistent postural perceptual dizziness. So this is the term that we use now. It was formerly subjective dizziness, but now we have better understanding. It's actually like a, a brain processing disorder. So um, you have the input from the inner ear, the eyes, proprioception, but the brain isn't processing that information correctly. And that is often triggered by a true form of vertigo, spinning vertigo, so anything like Meniere's disease, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, vestibular migraine. And then it, it leads to this chronic feeling of dizziness. And that's often seen in vestibular migraine, which can, again, make it a little confusing because the patients have chronic daily dizziness in addition to these little episodes of vertigo. Malde debarkment, that's disembarkment syndrome as well. Um, the feeling like you're still moving, usually after getting off of a boat or um, a long airplane ride, long car ride, and it can last for months or even years at a time. Post-concussion syndrome, you can have um, headaches that are very similar to migraine or even trigger migraine headaches, same thing with dizziness. Um, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, that's where you have the little inner ear crystals, the calcium carbonate crystals that will um, get out of place. They're supposed to be in the utricle, saccule, get out of place and go um, into the semicircular canals. And that causes vertigo just with laying down, turning over in bed typically. Um, so different than the spontaneous vertigo that we see with migraine or vestibular migraine. However, there is possibly an increased incidence of BPPV in patients with migraine. And sometimes migraine, you can't have positional symptoms. So important to differentiate between the two. With BPPV, we can diagnose that with the Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence, um, kind of a lesser known, a rare type of dizziness. Um, that's dizziness caused by um, a change in pressure in the middle ear, so coughing, sneezing, things like that, um, and also loud sounds. And what SCCD is, is a missing bone over one of the this um, semicircular canals in the inner ear. So our surgeons um, typically won't operate on SCD patients unless their migraines are, um, are managed well. A lot of patients with this condition also have migraine. And so the symptoms can kind of overlap there. You can get this phonophobia or noise sensitivity with vestibular migraine, which is pretty similar to the noise induced dizziness that we see in this condition. So. And then, you know, we do worry about some of the rare um, central nervous system causes of dizziness, multiple sclerosis, cerebellar ataxia, stroke, and things like that.
So these patients, um, this can be a really, really difficult um, set of symptoms. Um, migraine itself is a risk factor for anxiety and depression. And then dizziness is also a separate risk factor for anxiety and depression. And then because this is so challenging to diagnose, it's not well known, um, kind of falls in between the, the different specialties. A lot of times these patients are taking a long time to get diagnosed. And so that diagnosis uncertainty um, can also cause anxiety and depression. And I do see that a lot. Um, it, it really can take years to get the proper diagnosis and treatment. I had the pleasure of speaking with, um, she's a nurse as well as a vestibular patient, Lindsay Masegua, a few days ago. And you can see here, um, she provides these lectures to different healthcare specialists about, about vestibular migraine. And she shares her personal story. And you can see she's seen numerous specialists um, and it took quite a long time to get the actual diagnosis. So very, very challenging for these patients. All right, so the most important tool in assessing these patients is getting a good history. Um, and because of that anxiety, depression, the numerous specialists, um, the lack of, of great treatment, it is very important to listen to these patients with compassion and really hear their story because um, that's what's going to clue you into the diagnosis. Typically, these patients have a normal neurologic and vestibular exam. Um, typically, they will have a normal VNG or the vis video nystagmography, the uh, vestibular testing that we do. Um, sometimes we see these exaggerated response to caloric simulation of the inner ear. Um, sometimes they do have some positional nystagmus. But essentially, the VNG is going to be normal, unless, of course, they have other diagnoses as well. Um, and typically, the MRI is going to be normal. We do see white matter hyperintensities. That's a common finding in patients with migraine. Okay, so if a patient does have an abnormal neurologic exam, vestibular exam, the vestibular testing or imaging does not necessarily mean they don't have vestibular migraine. They might have something like Meniere's disease. Um, you can have BPPV and, um, and vestibular migraine. So just because we have an abnormal finding like a, a weaker ear on the VNG, one ear has vestibular loss, does not mean they're not experiencing vestibular migraine. You can have a vestibular loss from years ago. You can have something like a virus or something like that that will knock out the balance function. Um, but what do their symptoms fit with? So you have to look at the diagnostic criteria and again, listen to the, the history. All right, so moving on to treatment. Who is treating these patients? Um, usually it's a mix of ENT, particularly um, neurotologists or those who specialize in, in you know, hearing and balance, neurologists, and then primary care. When do we initiate treatment? Um, really, I go by what the patient is experiencing. If they are having these very frequent, very severe episodes, I will be a lot more aggressive than somebody who's having episodes on occasion that they can kind of treat symptomatically. Um, what we'll get to in a little bit is, is preventative treatment versus abortive treatment. Um, there's not great abortive treatment for vestibular migraine, like there is for migraine headache. And so with migraine headache to initiate prophylaxis, um, you know, you have to have these frequent migraine headaches. I will initiate um, preventative medication for vestibular migraine a lot sooner because we don't have that great abortive treatment. And then, like I said, it's it's rare for patients to come in with this, this definite um, picture of vestibular migraine. Um, I will treat probable and even possible migraine. So when I say possible, I mean, they don't really fit that criteria that I explained before, um, but they have no evidence of any other inner ear disorder and central other central causes have been ruled out. So they might have really unusual symptoms again, dizziness lasting for just seconds as, at a time instead of the five minutes, no personal history of migraine, no family history of migraine, maybe no light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, headaches or anything, but we really have no other 
um, plausible cause for their symptoms. And so I'll go ahead and initiate treatment. And it's really interesting to see um, how many of these patients respond to migraine medication. Um, and so I think that's a really important key. When I see patients who have seen a lot of other, um, a lot of other specialists and providers is, you know, they don't fit the criteria. And so they're nervous about um, missing another diagnosis, but really when you've exhausted all the, all the testing and, um, you know, you know that there's really nothing else going on, then go ahead and treat these patients. Okay. So treatment, um, a lot of it is the same as treating migraine headaches. So trigger avoidance is very important. Um, usually it's a, uh, a combination of triggers that will give rise to these episodes. So um, it might not be one trigger all the time. Sometimes the patient will be able to, you know, eat chocolate and nothing happens. But when you combine the chocolate with the change in weather or stress, um, then you can have an episode. So it is important to know um, to be familiar with the triggers, uh, dietary changes, there are supplements that we'll get to, the medication, neuromodulation, and physical therapy. So these are, um, these are the common triggers. I definitely focus on um, stress and sleep disturbances. I think those are the two, those are two of the main ones. Um, some of these other ones you can't really avoid, like weather changes. Um, you can't always control the environment that you're going to be in. Um, but when patients know that these things might happen, they can preemptively treat. Um, so it is important. Dietary triggers are also very important. Um, I do not like for my patients to necessarily do a very, very strict diet. Sometimes that can be, that can cause stress, right? It's hard to control your diet all of the time, socializing, going out to eat, things like that. Um, and sometimes uh, focusing so much on diet, like I said, you're going to um, cause a lot of stress and then you can miss a lot of nutrients that you actually need. So some of the common groups, I'll have them cut out like MSG, you know, that's one of the main ones I'll have patients cut out right away, tyramine nitrates. Um, and you want to cut them out for at least a month or so at a time. And then you can slowly add things back in and see if it makes a difference. Not everybody has the same trigger. So you don't want someone to be super rest restrictive when it might not be a trigger of theirs. Um, this is where keeping journals can help. Um, but again, you don't want the patient to be so fixated on it because some of these things are so hard to control and that can cause a lot of anxiety and stress. Here are the supplements. Um, so this is the American Headache Society and the American Academy of Neurology, 2012. In my practice, we use the top three the most, um, just because of the level of evidence, the efficacy, fewer side effects, um, especially compared to the fever few and better burr. Um, and a lot of patients do really well on these. Um, no, not many concerns, magnesium can cause some stomach upset, diarrhea. And so a lot of times we'll have to start on a lower dose um, or try different formulations, but typically these are tolerated really well and they do seem very effective. Um, so if a patient, you know, if they're not really ready to start a preventative medication or um, their symptoms aren't happening as frequently enough to warrant that, then I will definitely just start on these with trigger avoidance. Here's a list of the medications. This is a re review done by Smith, um, published last year. You can see um, on the left side, these are likely effective. Um, I will use all of these really, aside from um, Depakote at the very bottom there, this sodium valproate, um, just because that one is um, teratogenic. And so we wanna avoid that in women of childbearing age, which a lot of these patients are. Um, but otherwise, these are all great medications. They do seem to be effective. Um, and then interestingly, likely ineffective nortriptyline, even though it works very similar to amitriptyline, the study showed that it wasn't as effective. I will use it on occasion, especially if the amitriptyline is kind of working, but a little too sedating. Nortriptyline is less sedating. Um, and then Botox and CGRP inhibitors, there aren't a ton of studies on these, so we don't really know. 
I was just at the um, at the headache symposium this last weekend. So the American Headache Society. Um, and I did my own personal poll of a lot of the neurologists there to see how they treat their dizzy patients. Because again, there's not great evidence um, out there for vestibular migraine, not a ton of studies. Um, the studies that we do have are usually small, so lower quality. And it was interesting to hear how many, how many of the providers do see improvement in their dizzy patients with Botox and the CGRP inhibitors. Um, and then also I had some who use ciproheptadine, which is an antihistamine using that as a preventative. We know that this is effective in children. We don't really see it in adults, but um, some of them are using it and everybody and they seem happy with it. So I think the important takeaway here is you can try a lot of these different things. Um, and if none of the ones on the left are working, then go ahead and try some of these other ones that haven't been studied very much because we know they can be effective in migraine headaches. And um, if it's really the last resort for your patient, I think it's worth trying. There are some safety concerns that we think about with these medications. So antidepressants, if you're on you know, a couple of them or if you're on tryptans too, then we worry about serotonin syndrome. Fortunately, this is very rare. Um, and usually the doses that we need for antidepressants are a lot lower than what would cause serotonin syndrome. For pranolol, it is a beta blocker. You want to avoid it in patients with asthma or severe hypotension. I will still use this in patients who have normal or even um, blood pressure that typically runs low. Um, again, these doses are lower. I typically don't see problems with hypotension on this, but you want to educate the patient and um, if they can, you know, have them check their blood pressure at home. With topiramate and acetazolamide, there is an increased risk of kidney stones. Um, you know, if they have a history of kidney stones, um, I might not use it as first choice, but it's not a it's not a contraindication. You just want to educate the patient. You know, make sure they're drinking lots of water, avoiding things like um, grapefruit juice, and then valproic acid. Like I said, it's teratogenic, um, so you want to avoid it in women of childbearing age unless you do have strict precautions and um, education. But there are so many other medications that you can use. So, so then how do you choose the medication? Um, you know, we don't have a set guideline on how to do this. Sometimes it's just picking one randomly and seeing how the patient responds. But if they have any underlying conditions, you can kind of go off that. So patients who don't sleep well, who have insomnia, amitriptyline is sedating, they do take it at night. Um, so that's my go-to for that. A lot of patients have anxiety and depression, like I said before. And so we have, you know, multiple anti antidepressants that can help. Propanol actually helps with those, um, the physical symptoms of anxiety. So it can slow the heart rate and the breathing, which can be helpful. Um, if the patient is overweight and they're concerned about the, the possible weight gain with some of the antidepressants, topiramate can actually um, reduce appetite and help with weight loss. If the patient is underweight, then venlafaxine um, can help with that. And it's also effective in perimenopausal women um, experiencing hot flashes. Another key point um, that I like to educate my patients on is that patients with migraine tend to be a little more sensitive to, um, to side effects of medications. Again, it's a brain hypersensitivity issue. And so, um, so a lot of patients right up, right off the bat are nervous about starting a medication. Um, so I explained that that's very common. It's okay. We can still use the medication. We start at a super low dose. So lower than a typical starting dose, usually like half, you start really low and you can go really slowly, as slowly as you need to. Um, and then, you know, side effects, while they can happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's dangerous or that it's not gonna work. So a lot of patients, they're, they're nervous as soon as they start experiencing side effects, they're concerned, you know, it's a safety issue. So really good education about that. Um, and that a lot of the side effects will, will decrease over time. And, and then they'll start noticing improvement once they get up to the, the correct dose. Um, medication adherence is a big problem in migraine. So I think uh, spending some time educating these patients about this uh, is very important. And then also about how long it's going to take you, it might take four 
weeks to get up to the normal dose. So that's already a month where they might not notice any improvement. You're getting up to that target dose, and then you wanna give it about four to six weeks after that to see if it's gonna be effective. So I tell patients, you know, let's just plan about a two month trial for each medication. And then if it's, if it's not effective, you can go ahead and start another medication and wean off, wean off the initial one. Or if it's partially effective, you can try and add on a different medication. So board of medication, like I alluded to before, um, just unfortunately not a lot of great options for vestibular migraine. Um, antihistamines like meclizine are often used or benzodiazepines like um, um, diazepam. I think these can be effective, especially when the patient is experiencing like a true vertigo. So a real spinning sensation because it suppresses that, that um, vestibular system and kind of calm the spinning. Um, antihistamines you want to be careful with because if taken too frequently, um, they can actually uh, suppress the balance system so much that you can actually develop this 3PD or the persistent postural perceptual disorder. So you see that a lot in patients. They'll have this chronic daily dizziness because they've been using these medications inappropriately. So I try not to use meclizine for that reason, or if I use it diazepine or another um, benzo, then I make sure they're only taking it on occasion. So maybe once or twice a week, if that, but usually if they're having episodes um, that frequently, then we need to be a little more aggressive with the preventive treatment. Antiemetics um, like ondansetron um, and a lot of the others are effective. You know, a lot of these patients do have nausea and so important to treat that as well. We will try oral steroids if somebody's in just a really vicious cycle of vertigo. Um, you can try oral steroids, dexamethasone, prednisone um, to try and break that cycle. And then tryptans are likely not helpful. So this was published back um, a year ago, but then there was also a Cochrane review um, published earlier this year that, again, they're likely not helpful. And we really don't know the safety of tryptans in vestibular migraine. Neuromodulation, so I have a couple listed here. Um, I know there are a lot more than this. There are some studies, some smaller studies that show that it may be effective as, as both abortive and preventative treatment. Um, so I think it's, you know, something to consider. You have to talk to the patient about it. You know, some downsides, it can be uh, expensive, but um, if they're not tolerating uh, the other medications, things like that, and again, because we don't have good abortive treatment, it might be a really good option. Sleep. I think sleep is a really important thing to focus on. We know that poor sleep can trigger, can contribute to migraines. Um, there was a study done in vestibular migraine, you know, earlier this year that um, patients with vestibular migraine do have poor sleep quality, fragmented sleep, um, disrupted circadian rhythm. Um, you know, I will oftentimes check my patients for sleep apnea um, or at least evaluate, you know, symptoms. And then um, underlying anxiety and depression can contribute to poor sleep. So for these patients, you know, amitriptyline might be a good choice, but again, you want to be careful if the patient does have sleep apnea, you don't want really sedating medications that can worsen that. So if I start amitriptyline, I, I try and make sure they don't have underlying sleep apnea or make sure it's well treated. So physical therapy. Physical therapy can be effective in these patients. It does not help with the acute episodes. So it's not gonna help prevent the spinning episodes that occur, um, but it can help with that chronic daily dizziness that a lot of vestibular migraine patients have, that 3PD. So again, that's a central processing disorder. So the inner ears are working fine, the eyes are working fine, proprioception, all that. Um, but usually the brain is relying too much on vision as opposed to the inner ear or vestibular input. And so vestibular therapists can help kind of retrain the brain to use the inner ears for balance. Um, so my patients with chronic daily dizziness, I'll always send a physical therapy. It can also help with that, um, that, that motion and visual sensitivity. And then um, you want to consider, especially in older patients who might have other comorbidities, um, they can also have a chronic feeling of dizziness that's not necessarily 3PD. And this is gonna be more imbalanced when they're up walking around. So when you combine 
imbalance with vestibular migraine, that's really going to increase your risk of falling. So important to treat, especially, like I said, the older patients um, who might have peripheral neuropathy or arthritis, all of this can co contribute to proprioceptive disorders. Um, patients who are bifocal or progressive lenses, um, what that's doing is it's kind of blurring the peripheral vision, which we still need for good balance. So um, sometimes patients will switch to actually two different pairs of glasses, one for distance and one for, um, for reading, and they do a lot better. And then if there is any underlying peripheral vestibular disorder, um, so these patients respond well to physical therapy as well. Anxiety and depression, can't stress this enough. It's very important to address. Um, you want to reassure the patient, you know, it, you can't always see um, what's going on. The patient's feeling dizzy, but everything looks normal on the outside. And so that's really, really challenging. You want to reassure the patient that this isn't a psychiatric disorder. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, we see what is happening in migraine headaches, the same kind of thing that's happening with vestibular migraine. So reassurance is important. Treating the anxiety and depression can also treat the vestibular migraine. So amitriptyline, venlafaxine, propranolol making sure they're getting restorative sleep and then cognitive behavioral therapy. So again, treatment is very holistic. You wanna look at the whole patient. You wanna get the whole picture. Um, what seems to be their main triggers? Um, you use medication when needed. Um, you wanna look at the diet. So having the patients keep a journal can be really helpful. Decreasing stress, um, possibly treating allergies can help. And don't give up. So lack of response to even several migraine medications does not mean that the patient doesn't have vestibular migraine. And you can see there are so many different things to try. So I think we might be out of time for this. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few of the other disorders. I'll just go through it really quickly here. We already talked about Meniere's. Is it possible that it's um, a form of migraine? I know we are starting to treat Meniere's patients with migraine medications, even if they don't necessarily have a personal or family history of migraine before we consider any of those um, ablative procedures. Um, we'll treat them with migraine prophylaxis. 3PD, like I said, it's that chronic daily dizziness. Um, I like to use venlafaxine in this. So 3PD is treated with physical therapy, SSRIs or SNRIs and cognitive behavioral therapy. Of the SSRIs and SNRIs, venlafaxine seems to be the most effective in, in migraine. And so that's why I like it in these combination patients. Malde de Barkman, is it a form of migraine? We, we do see there's a higher incidence of migraine in patients who have this disorder. Um, so if nothing else, if they're not responding to physical therapy, I go ahead and try and treat them with some of the migraine medications. And then you can have a lot of other ENT manifestations of migraine. Um, so patients who come in with chronic sinusitis, but their sinuses look totally clear, um, usually a form of migraine. You can have isolated ear pain and ear fullness with migraine, middle ear myoclonus or tensor tympani spasm. Um, and then, you know, some of these smaller like case studies, a recurrent facial nerve palsy. So, in practice, um, because there are so many different ways you can treat vestibular migraine, it's important to focus on just a few things at a time and kind of seeing these patients frequently until you can get things stabilized. It's important to have a lot of educational handouts, you know, because there's so much information, you can't cover everything in clinic, having a way to get this information um, to the patients. And then if the patient is symptom-free, then, you know, consider trying to come off the medication. If they're open to it, you can always go back on. And then referring to um, the other providers, neurology, ENT, physical therapy, and all that. So that is all I have. Thank you very much.